Good morning. Many of us are back in the church building this morning, but you are very welcome to join us in this way. I'll try and make the online service similar to the one in church, the same songs and the same talk, so you aren't missing out except on the chance to meet up with friends, albeit in a socially distanced way. We're still going to be thinking this week about aspects of waiting, and we'll start with part of Psalm 40. So here it is. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock, gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you have planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly to help me. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, The Lord is great. As for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. Amen. And on that same theme of waiting, here is a poem about waiting. And after that, we'll have our first song. Advent is the beginning of the church year. And so we're going to sing a song which looks back at the past and says thank you for all that God has been to us. Come back, Lord Jesus, and do not be slow. Refine, renew, restore. We hope, we yearn. When is this coming? Why can we not know how long we have to wait for your return? Come back, Lord Jesus, and do not be slow. Help us in the lingering to learn Your saving way that savours love And so refine, renew, restore We hope, we yearn Come back, Lord Jesus, and do not be slow Refine, renew, restore we hope, we yearn.
as we light a candle in the darkness, we prepare our hearts for what's to come, waiting for Emmanuel's arrival, waiting for the coming of God's Son, and this life Our reading today comes from 2 Peter chapter 3 and starts at verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. Well, today's service is entitled Active Patience, and as Christmas approaches, I wonder how patient you are when it comes to waiting. Will you, for example, patiently eat one chocolate every day from your advent calendar, or scoff them all on the first weekend? Have you already written all your cards and wrapped all your presents, or will you wait until you've missed the last posting date? Are you holding back putting your decorations up until a few days before Christmas? Or have they been up for a month already? And over the past months, how easy have you found it to wait, to be patient, wait for restrictions to be lifted, for shops to open, wait to be able to visit your friends and see family members? Waiting can be tough. Last week we talked about Jesus' second coming, the Bible's promise that Jesus will return and bring the fullness of his kingdom on earth. And if we're honest, many of us can struggle with that idea. Uh, you might have heard some teaching about this which was confusing or even scary. And there are some believers who seem obsessed with the idea of Jesus' return and can talk of nothing else. Some might be put off by more extreme interpretations, by listening to those who are convinced they know exactly what every prophecy in Revelation really means, the order everything will happen, and who can see signs everywhere. So perhaps we do our best to ignore the idea of the second coming altogether. After all, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus returned to heaven. So it's understandable if people give up hope that God will ever return and put the earth right. Where is this coming? Will it ever happen? Will it be in our lifetime or is there another 2,000 years to wait? Well, if you feel like that, you aren't alone. Many of the first Christians lived with an eager expectation that Jesus would return in their lifetime. But after just a few years, some of them began to lose hope. How can we see this in, in what Peter writes in this letter? Just before the verses that I read to you just now, Peter has said this. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Does this kind of thinking seem familiar to you? You might have heard it from others. You might have even thought it yourself. Isn't 
2,000 years, a really long time to wait for Jesus. The scientists tell us that eventually the sun will stop shining in around 5 billion years and all the hydrogen in it will be burned away and its heat will come to an end. But for the time being, the earth will continue, although climate change might make parts of it uninhabitable with rising sea levels and hotter temperatures. But an end, as Jesus spoke of it, that's not going to happen, is it? After all, it hasn't happened yet. Well, Peter's response to this question can explain it for us too. He wrote, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient. And patience is tricky. We usually want things now. We're used to instant gratification of buying what we want now instead of saving up for things, of getting next day delivery. We're used to computers and televisions which turn on and give us instant access to any information that we could ever want. No waiting for tomorrow's newspaper or a trip to the library to look something up. I stand in a queue and to pay in the supermarket or the post office, fretting about how long the person in front of me is taking to unload their trolley or remember their PIN number. When actually it won't change my day if I'm ten minutes longer in the line. Especially at the moment when I have nothing time critical in my diary for the rest of the day anyway. Do you know anyone who eats their food in a huge hurry, bolting it down as if it's a race? And then they look at their friend who's just taken three tiny mouthfuls from their plate and says, why are you so slow? Well, the friend might reply, well, I'm not slow. I'm just savouring every bite. I'm being patient. And knowing that God is patient and prepared to wait should maybe challenge the hurriedness of our modern lives. Do you feel like you rush from one thing to the next? Are you always looking for the fastest checkout queue at the supermarket? Do you get annoyed when your computer does take, seem to take an age to download something or it takes you far longer than you think it should to get ready to go out? Maybe we need to learn what, it might, what slowness might feel like. Maybe this can be a lesson in God's patience. And beyond this, Peter tells us that God has a vital reason why he is holding back his return. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repeat repentance, says Peter. Peter knew that the final return of Jesus would come with judgment over the earth. Jesus' cross and resurrection mean that when we're in him, we have no fear of that judgment. But entering to God's kingdom does require us to believe in him and come to him in repentance. And for this reason, God is patiently holding back the return of Christ so that everyone on earth does have the chance to respond to his gift of forgiveness and restoration. Peter describes God's judgment like this. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. And for various reasons, this passage has sometimes been understood to mean that God is going to destroy the earth. And this has led some Christians to think that maybe how we take care of the planet doesn't matter. It's all going to come to an end. And this has fed into the idea that Christian hope consists only of a spiritual heaven, not a physical one. But that isn't the biblical picture. It ignores the, the prophecies, the promises that Peter is drawing on as he writes. The promise of Isaiah, for instance, of a new heaven and a new earth. Isaiah wrote, See, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind, but be glad and rejoice in what I will create. And Peter spells it out in our reading. He said, In keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. And this is the same new heaven and new earth which John writes about in Revelation 21. John wrote, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! 
God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And the important question is, what kind of new are these writers describing? There is a Greek word, neo, which means new in the sense that it didn't exist before. A new car or new clothes. But this isn't the word used in these passages. Peter and Revelation both use another word, kainos, which means having a new quality about it, being renewed or remade. It's the same word which describes our transformation as Christians. We are a new creation, a kainos creation. The old sinful broken life has gone and the renewed, holy, restored life has come. God's not planning to put the earth in the bin and start again. He is planning to refine it, remake it, renew it, restore it. The Bible often speaks of God's judgment as a cleansing fire which burns off impurity. Malachi wrote many years before Jesus, Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. God's judgment is a fire that will refine the earth until only pure gold is left. So the picture Peter paints here of God's final judgment, burning up all that is unjust, impure, ungodly, and laying bare the earth until the old order of things has been destroyed and the original intention of God has been restored. In Revelation, the city of God comes down from heaven to earth. The old order of things passes away and God promises to be with us on this restored planet forever. When you're waiting for something, knowing what you're waiting for changes how you wait. A child waiting for a Christmas present has a different attitude to a child waiting for the dentist. You wait for your wedding day in a different way to waiting for the MOT on your car. We're not waiting for an eternity sitting on clouds or an endless church service or an infinitely long sermon. That's why I don't like us to sing the, the last verse of Once in Royal David's City at Christmas, because it says this. Not in that poor lowly stable with the oxen standing by. We shall see him but in heaven, set at God's right hand on high. When like stars his children crowned, all in white shall wait around. I don't see much waiting around in heaven. We are waiting for the restoration of heaven and earth, not for an eternity hanging around all in white, waiting around. In heaven, this heaven, this new earth, every good thing will be made new and there will be abundant life for all. And knowing what God will do when Jesus returns ought to change how we live today. Peter writes, since everything of the old order of things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless and at peace with him. Since this is our ultimate goal, Peter says, here is how we should live. We should live in ways which please God, which imitate Jesus, which work for the good of his creation, which build community and society and which seek justice and fairness. We should communicate the kingdom of God in how we speak and live and so not only proclaim it, but even somehow speed its coming. But I'm aware that even in church, we're so used to rushing from one thing to another, from a song to a prayer, from stand up to sit down, we don't have much time to think. And now we can't even stick around afterwards and chat. So before we move on, we're going to slow ourselves down for a moment with a slow prayer. Just to give ourselves time to, to think, to be still, to wait. So let's pray together. When I am fearful, Eternal Father, help me regain your calm.
When I am rushing, eternal Father, guide me to your unhurried pace. Where I am restless, eternal God, help me to know your patience. Where I am anxious, eternal God, may I breathe in your peace. I breathe in your peace, Jesus, and breathe out anxiety. I breathe in your patience, Jesus, and breathe out restlessness. I breathe in your unhurried pace, Jesus, and breathe out my rushing. I breathe in your calm, Jesus, and breathe out my fear. Holy Spirit, fill me with your rest. Holy Spirit, fill me with your quiet. Holy Spirit, fill me. Holy Spirit, come. Amen. In the church building this morning, Graham is leading some songs and this next one is one of the ones that he is leading. All heaven declares the glory of the risen Lord. close we will pray together so let's pray. 
Father, we thank you that you are a God of forgiveness. That when we turn to you and accept your lordship in our lives, we are made new, new creations. The old is gone. And would you help us in response to your love and forgiveness of us to be people who love and forgive others? We pray now for our world, for our country, for the places where we live, that your will be done, your kingdom come. And we pray for those who are finding today particularly difficult, and especially for those known to us. Father, we pray that you will enable us to be those who cause your church to increase and not to decrease. Would you give us boldness in proclaiming the gospel, the good news that Jesus rose from the dead and that a relationship with him is possible today. We pray that as we wait, we will live for you and so hasten your return. And we pray that our homes, our lives, may be places where you have the first place, where you are sovereign, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. And let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And we'll close as we are doing in church today with another song on a video, one that reminds us of how to live as we wait, to allow Christ to be our light. So God bless you. <laughs>